something at calming our nerves and improving our our sense of belonging and and all that great stuff. And and I sometimes feel like when I enter spaces like this, people understand that, or maybe you know they they appreciate it. Um, and but I always every every week or every couple of weeks like read something I didn't know about that trees do that are really amazing, right? Um, so for example, a couple of weeks ago, I read an article out of Boston University that we all know that trees absorb carbon, but I didn't realize how good urban trees are at absorbing carbon. Actually, they're much more efficient than their counterparts in rural areas or in forested lands um, to do it. They just do it a lot quicker. And part of the reason is because it's a lot hotter in the city and they just do things quicker, which also means they die quicker. Um, but while they're doing that work, they, they absorb carbon. So I don't know how much of an introduction you want right now. I'll just say like real quick, what we do is I, I call our work tree equity. Um, and by tree equity, I talk, we talk about the distribution of trees in Boston uh, and their inequitable distribution. And that's due to, um, as you may know, things like redlining, systemic racism, historic disinvestment in certain communities um, rather than others. And those tend to line up with other uh, stressors, economic, environmental stressors um, that are defined. It's all, it's all packaged together. So that's one half of tree equity. And I think that's something that we're familiar with and you drive into a neighborhood and you can sort of tell just by looking up, um, you know, the character of that neighborhood and, and the history of that neighborhood a little bit. Um, on the other hand, the tree equity that we're, we're trying to develop, which is a, a lot more um, intensive, and I think but it needs to be foregrounded, is workforce development and who has access to the, to the well-paying jobs, the local jobs in tree care. And it tends to be white men, um, like myself. Um, and how do we create opportunities, uh, pipelines, sharing resources for uh, people of color, for people who live in communities where they maybe don't have access or don't understand that there are careers in forestry. Um, how do we provide them opportunities, trainings to do that? Um, and as you may know, the city has recently developed a, a conservation core program that's gonna be doing some of that. So it's interesting to see at this juncture with the new mayor, how our work is gonna interface with that work. Um, and I had an opportunity today to meet with uh, someone who's working on what's called the Power Core, uh, Boston Power. I think it's called Power Up, Power Core. I can't remember their name. Do you remember? Power, Power, Core. Power, Power Core. Core Boss. Yeah, Power Core Boston. Uh, we were out planting trees in East Boston this morning, so I'm still a little dirty from that. We planted eight trees, um, and East Boston has one of the lowest canopy coverages in the city. Um, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of fun. Uh, but it's hard labor and it takes a lot of training to know how to do it right. So how do you, uh, we got a great company, but they, they're not based out of Boston to help us come do that um, because they believe in our, in the values that we have as an organization. Um, but they are recognizing they, they need to give back to the community. Um, so it's, I, I could talk for hours on this. I don't want to, I, I want to leave oxygen in the room for, for <laughs> my colleagues here. Uh, but I'm really grateful for, for the chance to share. We are based in Fields Corner, um, and I really want to be able to um, be intentional that our, that our work continues to focus on areas like Fields Corner. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful, Kayla, for the opportunity that you've provided and the networking that you're doing there. Thank you so much, David. Um, I'll also uh, call on Apollo next. Uh, thank you um, and greetings everyone. I'm grateful to be here. Um, one way to uh, really go to the heart of the matter uh, is what I consider the biggest driver or the drivers for the Oasis on Baloo, which is a urban farm started in 2015 um, after Co the parent organization, Cotman Square, uh, neighborhood Development Corporation engaged the community in along the Baloo Avenue, which is near uh, Norfolk and Morton Street, and engaged them in a in, in a way uh, that it cultivated an interest in in a farm, and that 
so that the community went from wanting these four parcels of land that are comprised of farm, uh, from uh, went from be wanting that to become a parking lot, a massive parking lot. Um, this is right along the Fairmont um, commuter rail. So I could understand why people didn't want housing there, but sorry about that. I have this new phone and I cannot. Okay, here we go. We're going to shut it off. Yes. So, um, I, it, but there are other houses in this in this neighborhood, and it's a neighborhood that was long neglected, very much a neighborhood of uh, white flight um, and redlining and burning down properties and uh, owners uh, leaving the city and uh, letting the city take. These, these, these parcels for, for non-payment of taxes. Um, we, uh, meaning the Common Square Neighborhood Development Corporation, uh, developed a lot of housing in this neighborhood. Um, and we also engaged the community to um, create what ended up being the, the, this urban farm that I absolutely uh, love working at and leading. And I went there first in 2015 while I was training for the at the um, Urban Farming Institute. And from, from there, uh, the next year I became part-time farm manager. And more recently I became um, full-time and uh, I'm also uh, an, on an interim basis, the environmental justice uh, coordinator for our, our, our organization. Um, the farm itself, and I started to say this, I like to think of it as we are driven by a commitment uh, to promoting individual health um, uh, as well as uh, community health and also improving the health of the environment. All of these are uh, interrelated and, um, and, that's, and that's the nature of this work. Um, it's not just about growing food, it's about engaging people to become aware of the issues that they are there are that are we are facing and a lot some of that is definitely about how well we are uh wellness and there is, we all know um or it's very common that we uh communities of color in particular which are really are are uh, what we are most interested in not exclusively uh as a farm and in the environmental work that we do with common but um the, the inner city communities in Dorchester, like other neighborhoods in Roxbury, uh, Mattapan, and, and other pockets in other neighborhoods are um, often uh, exhibit disproportionate uh, incidents of diseases, um, the chronic diseases that are often related to um, uh, our diets and other social determinants of health. And in the food space, you know, we are about half an acre. So we know realistically we could grow 20,000 pounds of food and someday we'll get there. Um, we're less than that, but someday we might get there. But even then our, our impact, the yield would be a, drop, a relative drop in the bucket. So for us, the real return on investment um, is, uh, how we engage the community. People walk along uh, Baloo Avenue and say, oh, what are you doing there? And can I do that in my yard? And, and you know, and that's part of the return on investment. And it, be, it begins a conversation about the environment and about access to food and all the other things that relate from an environmental perspective that relate to uh, the production of food. You know, the reality is that um, New England, or most of the states of New England, um, don't produce most of the food that consumed in New England. So we are, and that was at about 15%. So, you know, we have a huge 85% that comes from other places. Um, and associated with that journey is a humongous, uh, a significant uh, carbon footprint. 
And uh, what we have done in, 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 the, in, the, the, um, in New England, we have created a vision to 50 by 60 or 60 by something like that. So we, we're aiming to increase our production of, uh, of local consumption, the, the consumption of local production um, by, um, do the math, 45, no, 50, well, going from, yeah, going 35. Yeah, that's the number I think. It doesn't matter, but we're talking about uh, how do we, we're, we're committed, the six states are committed to increasing the local production. What that will do, it will reduce the carbon footprint um, and also create benefits to the region. And those benefits do ultimately relate to um, climate, mitigation and 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 um and justice but that that is um the multi-dimensional nature of the work and i would add before uh, giving it uh, handing it off to the next um panelist or speaker is that common square itself is very much in this environmental space we look to collaborate with anyone in fact we're hoping to collaborate with David uh, at, at um, Speak for the Trees. Um, but among the things that we have done as well is um, planted many trees in the community, give, given away many trees in the community. In 2020, uh, we actually, um, with a partner, the, the farm gave away over a thousand trees, um, mainly fruit trees. And, um, and we have them at the farm, uh, but fruit, fruit uh, Trees really do help us combat combat uh, the heat island effect, which is such, which is really significant in a, in a in our urban environment in our city, and so much so that when we get extreme heat days like we did last year on a record number, um, we were giving away um, air conditioners to the elderly, and we got a grant for that. And we also gave them money to pay for it. And why did why did that make sense? It made sense because this was not only a good thing to do for uh, fellow human beings, but it was more cost effective. It was more cost effective for us to give them free air conditioning than to uh, have them end up in the ER, which was which often happens. You know, so the other area that we're focusing on is the emerging green infrastructure uh, economy. And we provide training and are constantly expanding our training capacity so that our um, residents get those good paying jobs uh, without having to be uh, indebted over a hundred, not a million, but <laughs> collectively, but hundreds of uh, thousands of dollars in, in education. Um, so, you know, in fact, if you, any of you are interested in or have folks that you want to refer to us, do do so. It might take a little while before we gear up with developing these programs, but um, we're, we're, we're right there at the table, making sure that this infrastructure is, um, industry um, provides opportunities for BIPOC, uh, uh, communities and um, and that is a way um, that we uh, make a positive impact on one of the drivers of that that affects environmental justice. Um, so, any questions? Reach out to me. Um, you know, come to the farm, uh, get your hands dirty. We we have a lot of fun. Thank you so much. You brought up a lot of topics that we'll probably touch on a bit later. I'll kick it over to Mimi to talk a little bit about her work before we get started on the conversation. Good evening, everyone. So, um, and yes, if you haven't been to that farm, it's a remarkable, remarkable place. And Apollo has just been such a great addition to, to that work. Um, it's so cool he's doing that work. Um, so David spoke about um, trees and Apollo spoke about food. And I think that the thing that really drives me is land. Um, and um, when Amina introduced me, she introduced me from my bio um, 
in terms of what I do for my day job, which is wealth building and um, access for uh, anti-poverty work um, and with, with um, the mayor, a uh, boutique organization called the Mayor's Office of Financial Empowerment. But I am here today to talk about my role in uh, the Crane Ledge Woods Coalition leadership team and the work that we've been doing in Hyde Park really to address uh, both bringing together uh, one of the most eclectic, uh, dynamic, multicultural, multi-generational neighborhoods in the city, which is Hyde Park. Um, and then also just the, the struggle that we've um, built and this uh, culture that we're creating specifically around the struggle to save Crane Ledge Woods. And so um, as part of that leadership team, I can tell you a little bit about what the Crane Ledge Woods Coalition is and kind of the inception of this um, very cool community movement that we're building. Um, so about a year ago, there was a, a notice that um, that this particular piece of land, which is 24 unit, 24 units, 24 acres of um, uh, active woods um, at the crossroads of Hyde Park, Mattapan, and Roslindale, um, was being uh, developed, potentially developed, and was was um, being looked at to build uh, a big market rate um, sprawling development on 14 acres of that unprotected woodland. Um, and the community, kind of everybody got together, looked at that and said, oh my God, what are we going to do? This is, um, as people know, um, Hyde Park is a uh, by park neighborhood, environmental justice community, um, fits under um, all of the um, criteria that was outlined both by um, the EPA and then most recently in the uh, roadmap bill. Um, and so people basically started to organize. And so we've been organizing for about a year um, to address that, that potential project. And um, we've got this really amazing coalition of folks, um, over uh, 60 ally organizations, uh, neighborhood associations, uh, Speak for the Trees, Codman Square, Neighborhood Development Corporation, all the neighborhood associations in Hyde Park, um, Mattapan Greater Neighborhood Council, um, community-based organizations, uh, neighborhood associations, CDCs, the labor community, people have come together to address the need to save this land. Um, and uh, it is saving the land specifically for uh, the environmental justice community, for the neighborhood, uh, and really for the city of Boston. I mean, I think that we very much see this as a struggle for uh, the land and, and recognize that um, there is a challenge with this struggle, which is this land is privately held. Um, and so there's a real dichotomy between the land being privately owned and the community coming together and saying, we want to retain this green space in perpetuity to make sure that that the community has this green space um, because it does, it addresses uh, carbon sequestration, it um, you know, addresses uh, floods and um, all the climate mitigation um, components of green space, right? I mean, it's really, really significant. Um, and the, the real challenge with a lot of this work is that um, it's in this development process. And so people have been um, really building this, this community. Um, and so um, we are kind of at this point where it's an inflection point in the city, right? I mean, we have a new mayor, um, we have a mayor who's committed to environmental justice, committed to the Green New Deal. And so we're very, very hopeful that as we move forward, um, we're gonna be able to save the space and keep it in perpetuity as a, um, protected urban wild. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to get uh, the city to put $24 million into the capital budget in this um, budget cycle, specifically for environmental justice inland mitigation um, for the whole city. And so the to purchase Crane Ledge Woods um, would be 
16 million and the rest we would hope would be available for all the other neighborhoods across the, the community. So, um, you know, that, that is the, the framework for, for the work that we're doing in terms of saving Crane Ledge. I think that the thing that is super, super important is that there's not been this kind of collaboration of all these different kinds of organizations coming together. Um, or there is also a, a very strong um, uh, component in the, the neighborhood association community that's spilling out to address the issue of long-term uh, racism in the community and how to address that. And one of the things we're gonna be doing is with the um, West Fairmont neighborhood group, we're gonna be doing a, an EJ forum as well. So everybody's invited to that. That's gonna be May the 2nd. And we have Mariama White Hammond is gonna be speaking at that. Uh, we've got ACE and uh, Consalvo and several others to really talk about similar to what we're doing here tonight um, with really trying to bring in a whole host of folk who don't know about this issue, haven't really thought about it um, around the whole question of environmental justice. So um, be really excited to talk about how people can get engaged and involved um, in this issue. Um, love that we're here talking about these issues and um, really, really happy to, to join you today. Um, thanks. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, I'll kick it over to our final couple presenters, which are presenters, speakers, uh, Noel um, and Gabriella. Thanks, Amina. Um, I'll jump in really quick. I'm Noel. She, her, hers. Already did the introduction, but I just want to say I'm so glad that the worlds of health equity, even medicine are now colliding with housing justice and environmentalism even more now, which is really great to see. And we obviously know that climate change disproportionately affects black and brown communities. So I'm just really glad we have this space. Something also I just wanna highlight for discussion later, as I know questions will come in is, we know that redlining and even just industrializing areas, it destroys the climate, it destroys animals, territories and areas and creates food deserts, all these things that impact our health. So often when people see these things as separate, like how is environmentalism or climate justice health, these things are intricately tied. And usually all those of us who are most likely to suffer from natural disasters like COVID, like pandemics, we're also on the front lines of environmental disasters, which we know so many black and brown communities are dumping grounds for toxic waste. So just some things to think about. I'm really glad the space is happening. Um, and Gabby, who is my comrade at arms, will also go into more about what that looks like specifically in Eastie, which is a real battlefront in Boston right now. Once she unmutes. Hey everyone, thank you for inviting me. Um, Noelle extended the invite and I've, um, just to quickly introduce myself, my name is Gabriela. I live in East Boston. I've grown up here my whole life. Um, my parents, my family, we have roots in El Salvador, Honduras, first generation US born. Um, I identify as an artist and I would say environmental justice, as in justice, um, organizer, activist. Um, I have asthma because I grew up in East Boston. Um, we're right next to the airport, we're right next to like <laughs> thousands of gallons of jet fuel tanks. We're right next to this giant salt pile and rock pile and the region's heat and, and salt distribution during the winter comes from East Boston. And unfortunately, you know, like people like me, kids, youth, now that our adults are still growing up, are, are living the firsthand consequences health-wise for having grown up in a community that has, that's now like front runner of gentrification, displace, of the displacement crisis, and also a health crisis, right? There's so many just outside of, you know, when, we, when I think about environmental justice, you know, when I was younger, I only really thought of it through a lens of, oh, let's save 
let's save the trees, let's save the animals. But, you know, growing up and like radicalizing and sharpening my, my, my lens, my political lens has allowed me to really understand that, you know, when we talk about justice, when we talk environmental justice, there's a lot of people who still don't understand the scope of what environmental justice means and what that encompasses, like housing justice, like language justice, like making sure that everyone has access to particular public goods, um, making sure that the air you're breathing in your house isn't, isn't contaminated by mold, lead, and or the, 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 the toxins that are just, you know, I'm being exposed to right now as I walk to my house, right, after an interview that I have to support someone who was talking about their, their eviction case, right, because their house is an unconditional purchase of one of the largest developers in East Boston called Evo Capital, who is just, you know, buying buildings in terrible conditions, right, and pushing people out as soon as they get the city's approvals to, you know, build what it is they want to build in that, in that building. And it's honestly disgusting to see what is happening in my community, but also beautiful to see the amount of resistance that has been growing, right, throughout the years, not only with like the growth of certain urban farms in which my older brother took part of in creating like Eastie Farm, but also, you know, the resistance in regards to like what city like Udurbana has been able to, to grow and develop here in East Boston. You know, I'm really proud to say that as an organizer, as a paid organizer at city like Udurbana, right, that this organization is a reason why a big population of, you know, like Latino immigrants are still housed in East Boston because they've they've learned the tools, they learned they learned these rights that has allowed them to stand up and fight back. Right? Because when we fight and we fight long and hard, we, we win. win. Yep. Yep. That's the motto. Um and and yeah, that's you know, I come from a lineage of of, of field workers who who've had to work their ass off and have almost zero arrest you know, back in their home countries and who fled civil war to, to come to this country with nothing and, you know, build a family where different people have taken different paths, have fallen down certain holes, and some others have risen to, to the occasion to help and have the power to extend a hand of support to others who, who need it. Um, and yeah, that's, that's my introduction. And I'll pass it to back to the facilitators. Thank you for inviting me. Um, thank you so much, Gabriella. That is very um, moving and inspiring story that you just shared um, about community mobilization, community engagement, but also some of the things that are really affecting communities right now. Um, I really wanted to pick on something that you said about that was actually my first question that sometimes, you know, we don't understand the the breadth or the the range of environmental justice so how would you and any of the speakers can sort of like take it up um take the mic but how would you talk about environmental justice the community to communities and how multifaceted it is i mean i think i think there are two things in environmental justice and, and I, I don't have the vocabulary to capture them. I mean, I think there are multiple things, right? Um, but I, I think when I think about environmental justice, there's the fact that certain people have worse environments than others, right? And that's unjust, right? And I think that at the basis is like the, the geographic distribution of goods, right? But then there's also like the procedural aspect of environmental justice, which I think we sometimes overlook. And that's how decisions are made by whom and for whom and whose voices are at the table. Um, and I think without that, then pro procedural justice, form of justice, you can't have real justice, right? Like, and, and I think about this a lot, for example, in our work with trees, because trees, are important, right? And they do a lot of great things, 
but there's also a risk in them gentrifying a community. So like for all the good they do, right? They also do things like increase property values, which for some communities is really important, but for other communities leads to what we call not gentrification, but greenification, right? Um, and I, were, I, I think it's the one thing that keeps me up at night is I don't wanna be planting trees in communities where those trees aren't wanted. And there are actually very good reasons why certain communities say, no, not, we don't want trees. Um, and that's procedural justice. Um, and it's awful to think that I can't, or we can't plant a tree in a community because people are like, that's gonna displace us. That's like, that's just awful. <laughs> we have to have that type of conversation. And we live in that type of society, that type of economic system, but that's reality. Um, and unless there's a process that that, that uh, uh, that's based on on equitable voices and, and justice, then we're gonna end up not not fixing this. Um, so I like to say we we don't come in we don't parachute and plant trees and leave. We are intentional about partnering with groups to ensure that the community wants the trees and will care for the trees. I agree. I also think, I mean, for me, when I think of environmental justice, I think of it as justice for the land, right? Like literally for the land. And in doing so, it's for justice for people. And I think it's so interesting how indigenous cultures, especially, there's no even like, it's funny to make a concept like conservation because conservation is everything you do. Like you're working with the land, you are, there's this idea that the land is not yours to pillage and plunder and take. And that is a very capitalist Western concept. And that spills into the same way that our, that our homes become for sale, our communities become for sale, because it's this idea of milking it for everything it's worth and not being grateful and using, it's about excess. And it's so interesting because I know for a lot of people of color and even for me, environmentalism, the space can be very white and like the very space of the conservation is gentrified in itself. And I think that's because it doesn't center people's lives as well as the land itself. It just kind of seeks to isolate the land and just say, here's this abstract thing and not recognize that people have different relationships to the land because people are exploited differently just as the land is. And it kind of goes into why, like if even in Boston, when you go to Brookline or West Roxbury, there are beautiful lakes and there's so much green space. And then you're seeing it edged out, like WD were saying in, in Eastie, it's, there's so much less tree cover. It's not even because so much people don't care or people don't have these values. It's because industrialization says we can cut down their trees. We can mow their yards. They don't need these things. That's for us to use. And in these other areas, people have enough agency to protect those areas. But so many people would if they had the tools to make those statements and fight for themselves. And that's kind of what we're doing. And that's why thinking of it intersectionally, environmental justice, climate change, it means so much more than just, you know, the superficial layer that it's often reduced to and kind of neutered to be. Yeah, I mean, I would just say the thing that's super important when I think about some of this stuff is um, even, you know, going back and looking at some of the language around the roadmap bill and the fact that uh, it's supposed to codify how uh, communities of color actually um, can um, be in the lead in these conversations and have impact when they've been, uh, their communities, when, when our communities have been um, negatively impacted by um, pollution, by the environmental injustice, by the pillaging of the land. But the, the, the problem is, is that there's no real mechanism to do it properly. It's like you look at what they're doing with BPDA and Article 80. Article 80 is the process with which is land disposition and development, right? And so um, community engagement is, is the focus, but people don't have real choice. They don't have real voice. So how is it that we can create this, these various pieces of legislation and give, give people real voice, um, access, political power, um, 
and the ability to, in fact, not just um, advise, but to, to be in the deciding, um, you know, playing role. I mean, to be able to forfeit, to say, no, we don't want this stuff in our community. We don't want the, the substation in Weymouth. We don't want Eversource coming in and telling us what to do in East Boston. We don't want 24, you know, we don't want 20, 14 units, of, 14 acres of green space clear cut to put to make way for a sprawling Arizona type uh, suburban gentrifying displacing building right I mean how is it that we recognize that we're supposed to change the laws to benefit folks but to make that real I mean it never feels real and so how do we continue to fight in the community to to make this stuff real to be able to forfeit um what historically has just been advice, right? People can say, no, we don't want this here. And we have the teeth and the ability to shut this stuff down. And that that's, seems to be a real challenge, even if we get the language and legislation, how do you make it real? Thank you so much. I'm hearing a lot about sort of, um, a system that sort of needs to be changed or disrupted in some way um, to really be people-centered. Um, so uh, Noel, you mentioned before that community members don't have the tools. So I'd ask what are the tools and, and how can community engage in environmental just more concretely to make it more um, people-centered and to really amplify their voices? Yeah, well, on a smaller level, and Gabby can speak to this too, like so much, especially in a lot of our cultures that we come from, learning how to live off the land, things like that, that's just our cultural legacy. But then as part of integrating into American society and not having the resources to do that, we lose that part of ourselves. So a lot of people, especially if you speak to elders, it's very normal to have a garden, you know, especially back home and grow your own food, those things. But here in the city, we don't always have the land or we're not taught, hey, you can propagate a plant, make a cutting, you could have a whole garden in your kitchen. These things are things we could do, but a lot of people don't have access to that knowledge. So a big part is especially centering on growing, on how to have your own relationship with the earth. That's really key. And then just knowing the fact that this is a space that's meant for you will make so many people engage with it who have those values already. So like a lot of it, especially think about the gatekeeping with veganism, for example, a lot of times language is more focused on the lives of animals than it is about combating the white supremacy that makes it so that we have to go through these structures, right? And I speak as a vegetarian, a long time vegetarian for nine years now, but it would have made such a difference for me to know that you know, I don't have to give up my culture and give up the foods that I value as a Nigerian woman to be part of this ethical movement and that there's no placing being part of this movement over my culture. It's not saying, oh, well, if your culture, for example, prioritizes cooking oxtails that you're somehow less civilized or less than another culture, like all these colonial norms are very present in conservationist circles. And that's not a reality a lot of environmentalists like to recognize. So looking at that and starting to decolonize these spaces will not only help us get at the integrity of what we're here to do, but it will also help people of color feel like they can engage in a space that's already their heritage and their legacy. Gabby, I know you can say more on that too. Yeah, and I guess in, in the previous question, like what does, environmental justice means just to kind of like connect my answer to this one you know environmental justice you know affirms the sacredness of, of mother earth alongside with you know the sacredness of like what it is to to be human to to live in a place that is just fundamentally like right politically economically culturally and like provides like a, a path towards self-determination for, for people. Um, and, and, you know, in opposition to violence, military occupation, repression and exploitation of lands, people, cultures and, and other forms of life. And, you know, part of the tools 
you know, just to like emphasize what, what Noel said is, you know, it's it's revolutionary to reclaim your your relationship with the land. It's revolutionary to grow your own food because you're disrupting the food chain that is being like propagated by capitalism, right? You know, it's it's revol it's more revolutionary to eat the fruit you eat versus to eat the fruits from from Dole picked by under underpaid undocumented immigrants who don't even have health care you know and and I'm a, I'm a struggling vegetarian <laughs> um you know um have the, do not, definitely do not have the nine-year track as Noel um and 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 it is really hard it is really hard and you know even while eating meat in the U.S. like a lot of the cultural foods that are healthy in, in, in your home countries aren't healthy in the U.S. because of the amount of processing like our, our foods go through in, in this like capitalist back exploited food chain that you know that, that's coming from like slaughterhouses where people are also underpaid right coming from like fields filled with pesticides where people are literally like struggling to breathe while they pick in the middle of fires, right? I'm not sure if y'all remember those pictures when California was literally on fire and all, all the workers that were forced to continue working and just given like the worst type of masks. They weren't even given masks in some of those places. And it's, it's you know, and, and the, some of the tools we need is, is just like understanding, a, a better understanding well, one, the connection to the land and two, a better understanding of like the sacredness of, of our own bodies and this, our surroundings along with like part of like respecting your sacredness and, 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 and accepting it is also just understanding your basic rights as people and the basic rights the, the land around you has. Um, you know, here in East Boston, we're supposed to have a right to the waterfront right? But we haven't had that right for decades up until these luxury developments finally decide, okay, let me wake up from this like speculative like uh, nap so I can make hundreds of millions more, I mean, hundreds of thousands more dollars because now is the right time to build and offset all, all this construction debris into the harbor. There was literally a point where there's this like these, these, uh, older Latino men who whose hobby is to, to just fish and like throw it back into the <laughs> just fish and like throw it back into the the Chelsea Creek and there was a point where there was just dead fish this is just there was just a moment when all the construction was happening along the waterfront there was just like hundreds of dead fish just like just in the harbor it's it was it was crazy it was just like wow I didn't even I didn't even realize that until like I had a conversation with with those like hobbyist fishers right and and they were worried they're like damn like you know if this is what the fish are, are facing like what does it mean for us who who are breathing this air of like the debris that comes out of and like in the and the the emissions that comes out of demolishing buildings and to building buildings right building new buildings from the cheapest materials possible right um just for the sake of making a profit while at the same time separating violent families violently through eviction processes. Um, and, you know, um, speak to the trees, you know, I, I invite trees to be planted here in East Boston, you know, and, and what I heard is the reason why the treescape in East Boston is, is some of the lowest throughout the city of Boston is because of the airport. You know, what, does, what do certain trees invite? They invite life, that flies in the air. And that puts our air, the, the, the certain like plane paths in danger, right? Which is endangering my lungs, right? Because there is not enough natural offset to combat these, um, these potential environmental disasters that are just either getting worse by contaminating more air or, you know, just we're just waiting for a disaster by continuing to just build cement, continue to build cement on these waterfronts rather than like natural offsets that can naturally combat a potential flood. 
floodings that already are occurring but will worsen one day we don't know right um and and yeah the connection of your rights and also you know pushing the government to improve you know our basic protections right a lot of this is happening because the government has not done its job you know the government is doing its job for the sake of like protecting profit not so much for the sake of like protecting the sacredness of mother nature and in which includes the land water the trees and our lives right as human beings um so that's that's all i gotta say thank you so much um i know uh david you wrote something in the chat if you wanted to um speak on that uh, uh so gabby you i think I mentioned this before you got here that we were actually this morning planting trees in East Boston with Delta Airlines. Um, they gave us a grant to they wreck I, whether you call it greenwashing or whether they have a real commitment, we can quibble about that. But at the end of the day, they gave us a grant to plant trees in in um, in the flight path of some of their flights, including East Boston. We might do South Boston, we might do Dorchester. We're still trying to scope it out. Um, but I would love to connect with you offline separately and you know learn more about your work and also you know explore opportunities for um, how we can partner together because there's more we have more opportunities and, and like I said, I think um, I need to learn more about how this work can be most impactful and most um, um, healing and and nurturing for for communities and, and mainly that's partnerships and locations right figuring out where and what trees can go and with whom yeah of course let's connect i'll put my um, email in the chat i appreciate that thank you maybe and a, a paul i don't know if you wanted to talk um speak to the question which was um what are the tools um available for community members to cause this disruption in the system that's needed? Um, not sure I, un I understand the question, but let me let me say this, that I, I and this is a question that I have and that I see from my experiences in, in Dorchester, uh, as much as I love trees and um, there, there are some tree haters among us. And sometimes they are um, looked upon as an inconvenience because of the leaves. So people, you know, have, I am almost certain that they have sabotaged the health of trees when people are not looking or people just cut down their trees. I don't know why they would do that. But I, I and that makes me, uh, um, and, and a similar incident is when people black top over their parking space or they, their yard. They take away all the green space. Churches do this. Um, instead of, they go from a, having a gravel parking area to a totally blacktop. I understand that that might come from um, a, a, a feeling that it, it is an inconvenience. Um, and homeowners do this too. And, and I actually stopped one day and questioned a maintenance guy. Um, I said, do you know that this is not good for your own congregation. Um, and he kind of looked at me, oh, I didn't know that. Uh, um, but the, the, all of this is to ask, how, how can we um, engage our community so that they become more awareness? Because a lot of times the discussion around environmental justice is up here, scientific, and um, and our people in general have are, are we, we all are uh, having to do so many things. We're always having to run somewhere and do something, and sometimes we don't stop to think about these very important issues because we don't know what global warming is, or we don't have a a, a, a sufficient understanding, and we don't know that. Um, you know, the importance of climate uh, mitigation and, and climate adaptation and, and taking remedies to make the, 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 to improve matters. But if we talk about health issues like asthma, you know, and, and, and 
race awareness of where that comes from. And, and that's when we start um, getting, you know, people get awareness and then they get engaged because we need to engage our, uh, our people um, so that, and, and that engagement also means making the political connections because we need to be in hold the politicians and the government accountable. And the way to do that is by understanding that if you can vote, you should vote. And if you uh, can vote, or even if you can, make your voice heard um, one way or another um, by attending meetings, getting involved on the issues that matter. And, and, you know, and we need to help people you know, be the, 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 the spokespersons um, that they can be. And, and I've, I've never met anyone who couldn't speak eloquently or compassionately about uh, things that matter to them and things that matter in the community. I put early in, in the chat, I, had a, I kept on hitting the, the, um, the return button for a space and I kept on sending the message without it being complete. But I was asking you, to support uh, the HERO bill, which is pending in the legislature. Uh, it's a wonderful piece of legislation that would uh, generate, I'll keep it very simple, generate six, approximately $650 million a year to be spent on housing, affordable housing, and climate adaptation uh, and mitigation. Um, and this is something that the, uh, Cotman Square is very involved with, and I would urge you to um, consider getting behind this bill. And it's something constructive that can be done. The, the slideshow is very simple. It, it's, a, it's a 10 minute way of connecting with your representative and um, using one of the suggested languages to uh, ask them to support it or take th thank them for supporting that. Um, and you know, one of the things, and I'll end with this, that Cotman Square recognizes that it's not just about bricks and mortar. It's not just about shelter. I mean, com take a comprehensive look at what happens across a community. Um, so that's how, that's how we end up planting trees. That's how we end up helping small businesses. That's how we end up um, having this farm and on and on it, get, it goes. Um, so I would just you know, be open to any, uh, suggestions on how to better engage and empower our communities. Can I, can I complicate this picture a little bit? Of course. And, 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 and I don't mean this in, in any sort of, oh, sorry, no, do you wanna? I'm just adding myself oh, to staff. Okay, sorry. Um, because I think, I think one of the reasons we find ourselves in in this conundrum is um, is we find we and by we I mean like the this traditional white environmental movement that's been you know the, the big green you know the Sierra clubs and all those like nature's out there right it's out like in, in the White Mountains or go visit it right and we don't necessarily and in order to like appreciate nature, you have to go take a walk in the woods, right? That's sort of like, and let's go protect nature out there. And I think what's been lost in that is the 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 recognition that nature's in our front yards, our backyards, our streets, right? Our crane les woods, right? These places that not everyone has access or feels comfortable going to the White Mountains for a variety of reasons, right? It, it's far, it's expensive, they don't see themselves there. Um, whatever the reason, um, and their stories are not, um, and their concerns about environmental issues or their, their ways of thinking about the environment are not uh, celebrated and shared. And so one thing that, that we're trying to do is, is find ways to elevate stories that people have about the environment through trees because at the core of our work is this notion that every culture, every individual has a profound relationship to a tree, 
You can look at it from the Judeo-Christian tradition with the Garden of Eden. You can look at the Buddhist tradition where he sat under the tree. I think every culture I've looked at has reference to a tree. Trees are holy or important in, in, in every culture. Um, so, but I think they're important in different ways. And so how do we uh, create opportunities for us to fractal, to sort of like, to, to, to refract those stories in different ways, but at the core of it, we all share this idea about a tree. And we might be speaking about trees differently, but that's okay. That's like, we celebrate diversity. Um, and I think one of the things that we're trying to recognize, and I think someone put this in the chat a minute ago, is it's sometimes hard in people's daily lives to stop and appreciate that, right? How am I gonna pay for rent? How am I gonna get food on the table, right? All those things. Um, but I think if we, find, if we create ways for people to stop and reflect about their relationship to trees, we can sort of expand that conversation to empower larger, I, I think of it as like a shift in how people think about everything around them. People don't see trees. They walk down the street, they don't even see trees. It's just like they have plant blindness. It's just unbelievable. You'll say that tree's been there for five years. We'll be like, what? I've never noticed it. So like, how do we stop and have people notice it and appreciate it? And that, and I think that's hard, really hard, intentional work that requires relationships, that requires time, that requires a change in our collective consciousness. And I'm gonna drop a link of a way we're thinking about doing it. And I invite you to join us in thinking about how we can do it better. It's brand new, I haven't really advertised it, but it is live on our website. We're collecting tree stories now. And we have three right now that are awesome. And I would love to get more if you have a tree story. Could you tell us a little bit more like what, what you would want in the tree story? So anything, it could be a poem, it could be a, like a, a, a video, it could be a photograph. We just want to profile relationships, um, personal stories to trees. I guess that, that's what it is. Right now we have three. We have one of a woman in Alston who's talking about the tree in her backyard um, and a little micro forest. We have a, a gentleman in the back bay who's talking about his dying tree. And then we have this woman in Hyde Park um, who's talking about a little seedling she planted 20 years ago that's now this amazing wow. huge tree. Uh, they're beautiful stories and our intern did an amazing job of capturing them. And we're trying to figure out ways to sort of open that up to a larger audience. Um, we have a couple of exciting projects in the works to like expand it, but we also need to figure out ways to share it out and then like re to reflect it back to the community. Um, so it's still a work in progress. It's brand new. Um, I think it's it's at the core of what we're trying to do. Um, to Apollo's point is like, you know, we ha really have to get people to talk about this stuff more and, and to, to, to just come together around it. And I think, I think but I think one way to, that's just a, that's just a really long, that's important long work. And, and another another way another area where I think there's a tremendous opportunity is uh, Noel. Um, uh, uh, what what that, that connection would help it, because people have the, they know their health conditions and that's an easier connection um, to engage them. On, yeah, so. Noel, I see you have your hair. Okay. Yeah, no. Um, also, I think it's it's really important as well, going back to the question of what steps we need. There are so many obviously interpersonal steps we can take, but the biggest thing we need to do is recognize the larger structural impact where we already know that 100 corporations cause about 71, 72% of all the corporate emissions right now that are literally suffocating this planet. And it's thought about 90% 
of corporate emissions of carbon monoxide emissions are from corporations. So it's really important. Like, obviously there's so much we as individuals can do, but we can't act like the only thing we need here is personal responsibility. And a lot of times we see people of color shamed for things like not riding your bike to work and riding a car instead. Like often it's people of color who are almost treated as the problem because, you know, for eating things that are like cheap accessible food that maybe isn't sustainably produced or fast fashion that's cheap, but is what we need. Like so many of these conversations often get bogged down in that. And kind of like Gabby was saying, it's important for us to realize that we can do all the personal responsibility we want, but if we don't halt these corporate and governmental systems that are keeping it going, it won't matter. Like that is actually what is killing our planet. So we need to do the macro work of fixing those systems, doing this on the larger scale, and then personally figuring out, okay, as healing, especially for us as people, how do we restore our connection to the land and our relationship with so many of the traditions that are already in our backgrounds? And it's also something too, we need to think about the barrier of entry because take foraging, for example, black people, it was literally illegal ever since sharecropping to pick your own crops off of land that you weren't perceived to have owned. And it was criminalized and literally the primitive police force, which was meant to catch slaves, could catch you, take you. It was literally a crime to pick something like chicken of the hen mushrooms, like things like collecting truffles, that was enough to get you lynched. And that cultural memory is still very much with us. Even if we don't know the actual detail, there's a reason why a lot of black people are not even given exposure to the outdoors, kind of like David was saying earlier. It's an issue of equity and access. So it's important to think of this and make sure that our environmentalism is rooted and work against white supremacy is rooted in anti-capitalist work in order for this to be something that really benefits all communities, not just the most wealthy or affluent or who are farthest from airstrips, like in the suburbs. Also, since there's a lag, I'm wondering as well, kind of, <laughs> which jump in, Amina and Kayla, if you want, but I had a question I wanted to ask people. Please do. In your, like in the work that you're doing, because I don't know everyone on the call, we certainly don't know everybody who's on the live stream, but when people think, when you think of climate justice or even climate change, I don't know if anyone here has seen the movie Don't Look Up but it kind of, it reminds us, it's so interesting how it's almost like COVID, this conversation of climate change, it's become so much of a bigger thing culturally that it shows us a lot about our identities and the trauma that we've been through, just a simple conversation. I'm wondering like, what's the first word that comes to mind when you think about climate justice? That's a really good question, though. I think I'm going to think on it for a minute. The first word that came to my mind was equality, but it was more like almost the lack therefore of. So I'm going to think a little bit more <laughs> for one word. <laughs> I would say breathing. Came and I was thinking rooted in equity. I like that, Mimi. By the way, someone had a um, a hand up um, a little while ago. I don't know. Sorry, I missed it. Felix. Oh no, it was just a little clapping emoji. So <laughs> oh, that's what that was. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm giving away my age. Okay. I'm sorry, Felix. Not to put you on the spot, but. I know that you're doing so much of this, especially black foraging work and focusing on this, like as your literal academic pedigree. So I'm just wondering if you have anything you wanna add. Um, yeah, sure. This is something I ha will have a degree in. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of the problem is that we kind of through a lot of things have been taught to see ourselves separate from nature, like even in 
like Christian tradition, like this tree has knowledge and evil, but like being a part of the garden, but also having dominion over it, that's also an independent study topic of mine. So I have a lot of thoughts of that separately. <laughs> um, but I think a lot of the times we see ourselves as, as nature is this very state thing that we can move and shape around us as if somehow it isn't sort of like its own canary. Um, it is very much, a, we are very much a part of it and we can't really remove ourselves from it. And I think a lot of times we kind of are made to think that like you were saying, Noel, about like corporations, it's because they are still trying to push and they're not, they don't have to see the end of the road because we live in a place where people are wealthy enough that they will just try to go to space if the world burns up, but not all of us can do that. Um, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts, but yeah. I really like breathing too, that Apollo said that. Um, but it brings me back to what Gabriella was saying earlier about how disproportionate asthma is in low-income communities and color, community, communities of color. Um, so I really, that one, that one is resonating with me. Did anybody I else? Was, Go ahead. Well, I I was going to say daunting, um, but sorry to put a put a negative spin on it. It just feels so, just like everything. Um, it's rising sea levels. It's you know it's it's cleaner. It's, it's dirty air. It's carbon dioxide. It's air pollutants. It's like um, people forced to work out during a while. You know, it's like everything. It's just like how do you even wrap your mind around that? That that resonates with me, uh, David. It it does it does come across as daunting, and maybe you know so much so that you want to like let me go and do something else. or think about some other problem and not that one, um, you know. But I I I I think that um, I have a lot of faith in 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 people, um, in in my community and. Um, you know, and and I'll and I'll stick to that, and I I will believe um, <clears throat> um, that they're capable of um, embracing these issues, and and, and they, they are you know taking on uh, corporate America is part of that, um, and and that's something that no one does um, individually. Obviously, but we have to do it collectively. And it comes partly, you know, one part of the answer is creating a culture of, uh, of uh, civic engagement and creating a culture of uh, loving Mother Earth, you know, uh, appreciating it. Um, some, I mean, I, I'm, at, I'm at the farm and I'm only four minutes away from where I live. And, and I start listening. Every year is, is different. You know, I hear more birds i see more birds and i and i marvel at, at at the wonders of nature and i want to share this but other people see this too you know there's an 83 year old neighbor she makes a point of feeding the birds and she knows how to feed the little birds and the big birds so that they so that they you know brighten her day and she appreciates that and and you know, she begins to school me about pollution <laughs> and and recycling, you know, and, and so that there's that potential and it's a question of how do we tap into it? it partly a question of how do we tap into it? But it's work out there, you know, and I'm glad that um, there are people on 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 this uh, meeting that are that are part of the solution. I want to be mindful of everyone's time because this um, meeting is only scheduled until 730, but I want to give everybody some time to give some closing remarks um, and maybe some follow up steps. Well, I'm happy to start. Um, I just want to say that 
this has been a really important conversation. Um, Gabby is just it's so great to be. I know you don't feel young, but I feel old. So with young people who have such great politics and um, really are addressing, uh, looking at, at environmental justice and, and economic justice as something that um, is deeply embedded in, in addressing um, capitalist greed. I mean, that that is so much the driver too in the crane ledge struggle, right? It's owned by a private landowner that wants to maximize um, the land and almost 100% of everybody in the community through five community meetings and article 80 and people coming together have said, we don't want this. We want green space. We want this to be, um, to be maintained, to not be blasted, to be an oasis for us and people are just being ignored. And part of it is that, as we know, um, communities of color in Boston have less political power and Hyde Park has less political power. And so part of what we need to do as a city is even though we elected Michelle Wu, and I think that's a good start, um, we need to join hands and really build political power around all of our neighborhoods together around issues of EJ and economic justice and um, and the stuff that we that drive us on this call and in this um, in this this conversation every day um, and it's it's just heartwarming to to be with young people. Um, I mean, I've been at this stuff for you know my whole life and I'm not a little kid anymore. Um, and I just um, you know the understanding and recognizing that um, that what white people have done to the land and what white people have done to community um, you know it makes you want to cry right I mean I'm not going to cry here but it I mean I apologize for that um, I mean it's horrifying and so we you know all we can do is really make sure that the environmental community um, the environmental movement um, which I historically you not know, have been part of. I mean, I was always part of the housing movement and economic justice, but that the environmental movement has to get, white people got to get out of the way and give power to folk of color. I mean, that is, is a given. Um, uh, seed it, right? Um, needs to be seeded by white folks. Um, anyway, just, you know, let's all come together and, and um, try to get more resources out of the city budget and um, make sure that the, the political promises of the Wu administration um, through political power, we can move her so that, um, that she does more for East Boston, for Hyde Park, for Dorchester, for all the neighborhoods that, um, you know, that have been so impacted by, um, by uh, environmental degradation. So we're going with the older uh, first, right? So, <laughs> I, I, you know, for me, I, it, this has been uh, uh, totally inspiring um, to um, listen to uh, so many of, of these bright lights uh, um, and it, it's, it just energizes me. So th thank you, um, thank you from the, deepest part of my heart. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and um, if I can be of any help, um, you know, reach out um, um, and, I'll, and I'll try my best. Um, you know, if we wanna create forums across the city and to elevate the discussion and to engage people, let's do that. Um, you know, so you're all, also welcome to uh, come to the Baloo Farm. Uh, we have uh, this deck that we built in 2020 um, that really is great for small gatherings, but it, you know, it could accommodate 30 people and small groups of community members um, or other activities if you wanna come and share your thoughts, um, your knowledge. Um, you're more than welcome. 
And if you want me to meet you somewhere, I love East Boston. I worked there as a substitute teacher a few years ago, and I found the children in this middle uh, uh, school uh, just phenomenal. And they were mostly Latinx kids who just had a vision for their community, and that was, ins that was also inspiring. But anyway, have time, we'll travel. I just wanted to take a moment to thank Kayla for uh, reaching out and finding us and, and inviting us, uh, inviting me to be here and especially um, want to just acknowledge, again, the young voices here um, and the harm that the, the legacy of the harm that, that I don't know, my generation, parents' generation, I don't know what generation is to blame for this. It's, it, you can go back, I think, generations. Uh, but there's an awful legacy, and um, and uh, you know, I still have hope. I don't think we're at the point where we can't turn back, but I do sometimes fall into despair, um, and and I hope we can together support each other. Um, I also am mindful that our and, and I think this goes hand in hand with environmental justice or getting at or, or getting at environmental justice is democracy in this country around the world is becoming increasingly fraught and frayed. Um, and we don't have a, a collective sense of um, shared purpose and shared language. And that really frightens me. Um, I see it in the country my parents grew up in, in Israel. Um, I see it in this country. We see it right now in Ukraine and Russia. Um, we, it, it's frightening. Um, and I do think we need to work on that as we try to work towards a more just environment too, because I think with, without it again, with, w without a strong democratic civic norms, we won't, we won't solve this. Um, and I don't know how to do that. I actually was talking to someone today at the tree planting um, that the organization started off more as a civic project than an environmental project. Um, when I was thinking about trees, I was thinking about ways for people to come together and hear each other and see each other. And I think that's the power of a tree is, it is it's an invitation to that. Um, so our environmental work has to be rooted in, a, in a, some sort of civic, uh, shared civic purpose um, for a better tomorrow um, that's bigger than any of us. Um, and I don't know, I don't know how that lands, just sort of like riffing here, but I so appreciate, and I'm going to drop a link in the chat window. We have Arbor Week coming up in a couple of weeks. We have a ton of events. We have a foraging event for those of you who are into foraging. It is booked, but if you send me a, a kind, gentle email, I will get you off the wait list and into the event. Um, so. I'll drop that in there. It can't be said enough. Thank you so much, Amina and Kayla, for hosting this event and to your respective organizations, Vital Connections. Um, and thank you to all the panelists as well. I think it's really good that we're in this phase. One of the best parts of virtual meetings is we're breaking the siloing that's been happening in Boston, especially for, for a while. So. Anything we can do to fight back against all that we're seeing here and all that's affecting us in different amounts, but affecting us all. So thank you very much. Um, and also please keep in touch with us. And if you want to help with some chickens who I'm trying to keep safe with friends from the avian flu pandemic right now, selfish plug, please message me. I could use help with the enclosure on weekends. Thank you, Gabby or um, Felix, did you wanna share anything before we get off? You sure? Uh, just thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, Seconding what everyone said, thank you. 
thank you all for coming on tonight. Um, Mina and I will be in contact with some resources following up.